in amongst the prophetic message of Isaiah are these uh, words that I want to start with for our reflection. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Uh, it's always hard to make uh, claims about the uniqueness of our times uh, because it, I'm sure someone can disprove them. But there's certainly a trend, isn't there, in our, our society and probably many other Western societies that uh, the denial of mortality um, is to the forefront. Uh, people just don't like talking about it. They don't like acknowledging the, the fact that they are mortal. And I've even run to people in pastoral situations who, um, you know, as far as I can see, they're at the stage of life where considering that they're not going to be around forever could be fairly relevant data that they would want to be adding into their reality. But they say, hey, I'm only 80, what are you talking about, you know? Don't try and, don't try and shorten me out of here. I'm, uh, oh, you know, I'm, I'm not thinking about death. I've got lots of things I want to do, you know? Visit Machu Picchu, um, <laughs> climb a mountain, go on a cruise down the Danube. Hey, I've got a, I've got a list of things that long that I'm going to do in my 80s or whatever it might be. Now, that's not to deny that we should seek to be vigorous in the Lord's service for as long as we have breath, but I think we are in a, uh, a kind of society that, that does, in its uh, washover of information, seek to promise us something which is um, plainly, to anyone who has the basic understanding of how things work, undeliverable. And, and this, I think this is quite a, a deceptive reality that many people are almost uh, drawn into. If, if I put up a, a, a big mental barrier against this reality, well, somehow it will go away. If I kind of talk about it, somehow I'll be letting that barrier drop down and I'll be inviting death to come and play me prematurely. Now, we know this is, uh, this is a very false understanding, but it's, it's really, you know, the basis of understanding who we are and who God is, is, of course, the basis of uh, any proper living of life. And I think there's reasonable evidence to think that we, the people in the gathering in this room, should be, uh, you know, in, in amongst our people in our society, some who can most embrace the reality of our situation. That we are mortal, God is immortal. We are created, God is our creator. We are accountable to God who is the measure of all things. It's at the center of the prophetic message of Isaiah and many others who speak. I don't think we have much of a study anywhere in the scriptures or anywhere else of the psychology of some of the people who are the great figures. And I, you know, again, I don't think we can um, overdevelop things. But if you think about John the Baptist, if you put yourself in his place, if you, if you put the affirmation you feel when you have some success at what you do in his place, I think you probably have, uh, you know, reason to think um, pretty good things about yourself. I mean, we know he's got a, a very strong kind of uh, a self-identity, a strong ego, you might say, because, you know, who else gets around in, uh, you know, camel hair clothes and lives on locusts? You've got, to have a, you've got to have a pretty strong sense of who you are and what you're about to do that. But he's out there and he's getting a, he's getting a great response. Now, isn't that something that we love? Don't we love getting a great response? Like, it's, it's kind of wired into us as people who have, uh, you know, in one aspect of what we do, uh, a public performance ministry. If you're confronted with a poor response or people who, uh, you know, gripe at you continually, you know, it wears away at us. We're, we're kind of people, whether we start off in our vocation or not, we really do flourish when we get that kind of positive response. So, you know, of what we know about ourselves, and we kind of imagine ourselves into the space of John the Baptist, you know, even if he's a person with very limited ego needs of affirmation, he's certainly getting a lot. He's getting lots of people coming, and it's, it's notable. It's around the country. He's the, he's the person they're going to as kind of, you know, perhaps smelly and uncomfortable and weird as he might seem to the, the genteel townsfolk and uh, the people of Jerusalem, they're going to him. 
and, uh, and he's got to be taking something like that. So I think that makes it even more remarkable that, that he doesn't get caught up with himself. It makes it, to me, entirely remarkable that he can say, well, despite all of this, I have this message from God, which I know to be true. And the, the facts of my success, they don't kind of qualify that and, and uh, you know, spin it a bit so, well, maybe, maybe I'm the one that this is really about. Quite apart from that, he has this great clarity of where he stands in respect to God's Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he sees him and engages with him and, and brings him to baptism in the Jordan, uh, it seems that there, there is no disjunction between the clarity of his vocation when he sees that happening and any sense of ego harm that he's not in the middle. Now, I think that is, you know, I don't want to over-psychologize this, but it seems to me this is, this is one of those truly remarkable pieces of clarity of vocation that we can read about in the New Testament. There are others, but this is a this is one of those remarkable times of great clarity. And I think we're always helped if we have that clarity of our own vocation. A, the clarity of where we stand in respect to God, that we are created, we share in the continuing works of God, but we have, we, we have a distinctive place compared with God in all of these purposes that we are engaged in. And that as much as we might experience, and I hope you do, uh, success, affirmation, you know, if you, have the, if you have the joy of combining all the things that people would like, what are the things that people would like to have at one time? Youth, kind of popularity and success. Well, some of you have got that probably in spades. Isn't that great? Sometimes you might not have that, maybe you don't have the youth, but you might have popularity and success. Or maybe you haven't got popularity or youth, and maybe you haven't got success. So what are you left with? Uh, are, are you, as the circumstances of the narrative of our society would then tell you, you're kind of nothing, you're empty, you're on the scrap heap? Well, of course not, because we know that we have, in our vocation, as deacons and priests and bishops, in the service of God and the service of his church, something which is bigger than all of those what you might call socially constructed things around us. And so if we've got all three, and perhaps a bit more going for us, we need to guard our spirits that uh, as any, of the, any aspects of those drop away, we don't, we don't have any less sense of the clarity of our vocation as we continue in our service of God and His Church. And I think that's a challenge. It's a challenge to us because, you know, we are, we are like the, the withering grass and the, the fading flower. We, 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 will, we will have those vulnerabilities. And of course, you, uh, some of you who are uh, good scholars of the New Testament will probably know um, some great things about the, the wonderful movement of the verbs in the prologue of um, uh, John's first epistle. You know, the sense of the, the enduring significance of uh, the presence of the Word of God in creation. The enduring significance of uh, the source of the Son with the Father. The activity into the present of the revelation of God in Christ. And then the absolute presence of announcing the good news and the bearing witness to Christ in a community. It's really worth looking through that, finding a, finding a biblical commentary that, that unfolds some of that movement of those verbs in those words, because I think that it's, uh, it's very full with, uh, with a sense of the meaning of many other things which are picked up in the truth of the gospel. And that brings us to the, you know, the real and present reality that we have as passing as our time on this earth is, as fleeting as our youth and our success and our popularity may well prove to be, and irrespective of how the society around, around us constructs our sense of uh, who we are and what we do, 
which I think you can see if you've been watching for a while is being constructed a bit more negatively than it might have even a decade ago, that irrespective of those things, we have the same imperative of announcing the good news and witnessing to our Lord Jesus Christ in society that God has been pleased to bless us with this life and our presence amongst us. So I pray for us all that in this time together, you know, we'll, we'll learn some things that will widen our understanding, we'll have the scriptures enfolded to us, but we are, I hope, called more into the sense of the confidence of the, the fellowship with, we have with each other, but not just with each other, but to the wider church, and to the church that extends uh, back before we were even born, and will continue with souls not yet even present in the world. I mean, what a powerful thing to feel that continuity of which we are part. Yes, it might be a fleeting time that we are framing uh, our period of faithfulness within, that we're doing our proclamation, our witnessing within, but let us have a real certainty and a confidence of where we stand in service of God who through his Son has done things which are not just uh, past things of note and are notable, but, but things which are present in their significance and their enduring purpose. Now let's encourage each other because, uh, you know, I guess some of us don't have, uh, they might, we mightn't feel we've got much of those three things, you know, the youth, the success, or the popularity going for us. So let's, let's find someone we can encourage. Check out how they are. This is a great time to be together. I mean, it's not a retreat. We've got plenty of time to talk with each other, to have fellowship. You know, really go out of your way to find someone you wouldn't early bump in with. You know, you might have, you might know someone who went to college with you. They're in your ordination cohort. You're in the deanery. That's great. Build and affirm those things because they're important. But let's spend some time in crossing over uh, some of the differences that we have. Uh, you know, and even if it feels a bit awkward, why would I talk to that person? They're so much younger than me, they're so much older than me, they come from another culture, come from another kind of emphasis or tradition, I've got a big stereotype about them in my mind. Find something that really is a bit of a barrier and step across it. Even sit down with them, have a meal with them, who knows? Wow, it could even work. So, uh, bless you in your journey through these couple of days. It's a wonderful thing that we can come together I'm very grateful for uh, Bishop Brad and his team who put things together for our very distinguished international guests who are with us and have blessed us with their presence. And uh, I pray that it will be for us all uh, a rich time and a time of, uh, of God's making that continuing reality of the presence of Christ through the Spirit uh, here abundantly open to us.